So welcome everyone uh, to this roundtable on building resilient SME sector in Ukraine, challenges and solutions. Today we will be talking uh, about the small and medium sized enterprises, but also we will discuss some big corporations and how investors uh, see the current situation in Ukraine in light of the Russian-Ukrainian war. Uh, we will also discuss the specific sectors of Ukrainian economy and how firms uh, adjust to this uh, difficult situation, uh, especially we will talk about uh, the agricultural sector and the IT sector. So uh, the plan for today, the agenda for today is uh, for us to first of all uh, discuss the the uh, firms uh, and enterprise level situation uh, in general. And uh, first, uh, Yuri Haidai here will talk about that. Um, then we will move on to uh, overview of, uh, of investors' perceptions of the war and uh, how big corporations uh, react to the war. And uh, Sofia Huzanko here will, um, will talk about that. And then we will move on to the IT sector with Yaroslav Krimpovich here talking about that, and then agricultural sector uh, led by Oleg Nivievsky here. I will introduce all of the, all of the participants um, in a second, but before we start with our discussion and our roundtable, I would like to give a floor to Roger Casale from New Europeans uh, who would like to say a couple of words uh, before we start. So Roger, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you and hello everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. No need to respond, just uh, nod if you can. Yeah, thank you. So the first uh, words I'd like to say are to you, Ola, and to Jan, uh, which are thank you. Thank you for uh, organizing today. And thank you also to all of our participants. I'm uh, hugely looking forward to hearing the contributions and the discussion. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be with you today in person, but I was delighted to be with you um, at the Kosminski University on the 13th of April when we launched this uh, new um, developed set of developments, new set of uh, uh, workshops as part of the overall work that we are doing with our partners, Media Dialogue, Wolfgang Reisman will be speaking to us in, in a second. Delighted to see Wolfgang here um, on, on Ukraine. And I should say that um, New Europeans is a civil society, pan-European civil society organization that is um, really dedicated to making a reality of uh, what we might call Europe of the citizens. So it's Europe, remembering that Europe, the European Union is a union not just of nations and states, not just of markets and money, but also of citizens and civil society. And obviously, given the um, horrendous events that we are uh, witnessing uh, in uh, Ukraine, uh, and our, our thoughts are with all those who are suffering so much actually in Ukraine and uh, their family members who and friends who are outside Ukraine, we think in particular of a director of New Europeans, Lena Kush, who is also the first secretary of the National Union of Journalists in Ukraine. There's a lot of attention on Ukraine and that will uh, continue, obviously. Um, and suddenly uh, everybody's talking about Ukraine for all the wrong reasons, of course. But I just want to point out that the work of New Europeans predates the, uh, the war. And so I think when um, the war began, we thought, well, um, what's the best way for us to spend our time? And I think our answer to that question was, we need to focus on the long term, because there will come a moment when uh, we hope that, that uh, the fighting will stop as soon as possible and peace will come and as soon as possible. But uh, it looks as if that this will be a prolonged conflict and the level of public interest cannot be guaranteed to be maintained uh, indefinitely. And so I think there's, there's, a, there's a role for organizations like us and our partners to uh, look through the, the, the current moment to the longer term and um, uh, think perhaps also about the, the, the job of rebuilding that needs to be happening in Ukraine. And I think our message though is the same from before the war, during the war now and afterwards, which is that the voice of citizens and civil society needs to be heard in all of this. And not just, um, you know, post facto, uh, beforehand as well. It needs to be, we need to, and that's why I think 
this particular workshop today and also the one we had on the 13th of April are so enormously valuable because we need to start thinking through the practical issues, the key issues, the strategic issues well in advance. And then I think you might say, well, that's why I'm here. And that's why I've come to this workshop. But you might also ask yourself, well, um, what difference is that going to make? And I think that's a, an excellent question if you are about to ask, if you are asking yourself that question, and we should discuss that together. I think it can make a, a difference because organizations like Media Dialogue and New Europeans and our other partners, Kuzminski and you, each of you individually, we all have uh, people that we can talk to. Uh, we will have the opportunity to make our voices heard. But I think we're going to do that much more effectively if we work together in a coordinated way and in a, in a joined up way and together. Um, and if we have some clear messages and we keep repeating them. So I, I hope that today will bring some clear focus, some clear messages. And certainly for my part and for the part of you Europeans, we will do our best to get behind those messages and reinforce them and make sure that they are heard and that they really do make a difference. So that's far too much for me. But um, as I say, um, we are very committed to this. We're delighted that this uh, event is taking place today as part of a series. Um, I will put uh, notes in the chat about some of the previous events that we've done. Um, and I'm looking forward very much to the next event, which will be on the 11th of May, I believe, two days after Europe Day, 9th of May, which, of course, when we celebrate not just the European Union, but the Council of Europe, which Ukraine is a member. Uh, and we remind ourselves that Europe is not just the European Union. Europe is a community of values which are far broader than the European Union itself. And it is exactly those values that uh, people of Ukraine are laying down their lives for to defend today. And we expect that Mr. Putin, as we know, will have some sort of event on the 9th of May for his own reasons. We won't talk about that, but I think we do want to remind ourselves we are Europeans uh, and it is important that we have uh, solidarity and that we uh, stand up for what we believe in when it's challenged and um, that is that has a um, obviously a military aspect to it as an but it also has an economic aspect and an aspect in civil society and um, we, we you know we're not a humanitarian organization at New Europeans we're not obviously a military or economic organization but we do care passionately about the voice of citizens about your voices about civil society and um, making these voices heard. So uh, thank you for being here today. It's important, it matters, and we will help to make sure that it makes a difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Roger. Uh, and now I would like to give a floor to uh, to uh, Volgan Pressman from Media Dialogue, another partner of ours. Volgan, go ahead. Yeah, hello, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation perhaps i can make a, a, a short report about the congress we made uh, on monday and uh, on tuesday in um, berlin with the uh, organizations of public access channels in germany there we had a big panel about a media dialogue project uh, lina uh, lina kush uh, reported about her, uh, her work um as uh, what the ukrainian journalists are doing in the war uh, situations uh, we had uh, also Yevhen Simbalenko from the Institute of Journalism telling us uh, what they do to uh, reorganize in war times the educational process in the uh, at the university. And we showed Roger knows well Lena Kornberger from New York uh, represented our uh, uh, TV format uh, for public access channels in Germany, uh, Media Dialogue TV. So uh, we had also international guests from uh, BIJ, from the uh, Belarus um, Journalists Association, just got the prize from the US, uh, from the UNESCO and uh, also from Armenia. So uh, uh, also in the, for this audience, this was very interesting and it was live broadcasted by uh, Alex uh, Berlin in the uh, in the Berlin area and TV. So uh, that was, uh, I think also, uh, also a good uh, good possibility to show 
what we are doing also here with you uh, uh, in Basava and that we keep on talking about this uh, the whole um, the whole process in Ukraine last sentence from my side at the moment I have two guests working at OKTB Ludwigshafen from Kiev uh, one Alina from the international department of the city uh, and Jaroslava who also had been here uh, some years before for practice as a journalist and I invited them uh, both two to join us uh, today. They are just sitting in a room uh, beside me. I think it's very interesting for them uh, too. So you see, we are we are still active in this uh, in this crazy times, and um, yeah, let's hope that we will find good solutions also today. And uh, uh, what means the war economically for West and especially for Ukraine. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Wolfgang. Uh, and now the floor uh, goes to Jan Grzymski from IC. Yeah, I mean, uh, welcome everybody. Yes, I mean, um, I, I do um, uh, thank all of the participants who uh, who are here. Um, as Roger said, um, and we are. Uh, this is the part of the series which uh, which we do, and uh, I'm, I'm very very grateful that uh, all of our partners uh, are here. I'm, I'm equally in the IC in the Europeans and um, and, and hard uh, to Kozminski University. So we are partners, but we also work together as a as a great team. And I think this grassroots energy uh, will turn into something uh, practical in in, in terms of. Um, uh, in, in terms of uh, civil society activists, local activists, entrepreneurs, uh, young leaders, graduates of uh, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian graduates of many European and Ukrainian universities, um, which uh, in the last uh, several years were um, getting education, getting their aspiration hopes uh, and locating them uh, in Europe uh, rather than in um, in uh, in Russian in, in the Russian world, uh, so that's uh, th this is extremely important. I just don't want to um, use so much time to um, to uh, we have um, we have a lot of guests to uh, to follow. So uh, just thank you very much. Uh, um, we are in a, a strong partnership, and we hope that uh, this will go further um, over uh, the next uh, several weeks. Uh, uh, so um, it's it's really great to see the energy. Thank you very much, Jan. And um, and now let's start our uh, discussion. Let's start our roundtable. So first, um, we will talk. Um, we will we will see the the discussion, the talk of Yuri Gaidai, who is a senior uh, economist at the Center for Economic Strategy. Uh, Yuri also served uh, as an inspector of Business Ombudsman Council of Ukraine, where he uh, learned a lot about the way business is done in Ukraine and he has hands on uh, experience in uh, analyzing uh, data and uh, and uh, the way uh, firms develop and um, operate in Ukraine so he has uh, lots of uh, lots of insights to share with us and so Yuri the floor is yours uh, thank you so much for being here Thank you, Olga. Uh, hi, everyone. And I just can't refuse myself a pleasure to tell a few words in Polish. So, witam szanowni państwo. Dziękuję organizatorom wydarzenia. Dziękuję za uwagę do Ukrainy, za wszelką pomoc i wsparcie, jakie go udziela nam Polska. I no, będzie dalej mówić po angielsku, bo niestety nie znam dobrze terminologii ekonomicznej. And because uh, some of our participants speak in English. Uh, so uh, first, uh, I, I will try to give you a general overview of what is Ukrainian economy now, uh, how it suffered uh, and how it uh, tries to to be resilient, to grow, to rebound from uh, from the initial shock, which uh, which it received with the beginning of the war. Um, 
So uh, we will overview general economic consequences. Uh, I will tell a few words about the work on physical damages assessment, which is now uh, going on. Uh, issues with migration, human capital, and uh, of course uh, the policy response which was undertaken and uh, what uh, may be the outlines for policies for, for the future. Uh, so uh, the effects of, of the war are, are really devastating for the Ukrainian economy. Uh, there are different forecasts uh, from 10% to 45% decline uh, for uh, this year. Uh, we have uh, data from uh, electric grid uh, operators uh, who noted uh, consumption drop of electricity by 35% in March, and uh, this may be a quite accurate uh, estimate also for um, economic activity, but uh, we are observing uh, rebound, and um, especially given that uh, northern territories uh, are de de occupied now, uh, maybe the most pessimistic forecasts will not come true. Uh, if there will be no major negative developments, we may expect uh, uh, GDP decline uh, of 10, 20, up to 30 percent, no more. Uh, initially, uh, over half of the business activity was frozen. Um, based on uh, most recent uh, uh, questionnaires, feedback uh, obtained from business, from business associations, now 41% uh, of business fully restored operations. And uh, almost all of other business uh, operates par partially, of course, uh, except for those businesses who are in an active war zone or on occupied territories uh, for which we do not have information. Um, exports uh, now are at 50% of pre-war volumes. Uh, and uh, basically, uh, this is one of the major challenges which Ukraine uh, faces now in terms of economic, uh, for the economic strategy and development, is that uh, all the maritime logistics is effectively blocked by Russians. Uh, so uh, before uh, war, uh, 62 up to 70 percent uh, in value of all the exports was uh, it was uh, exported uh, by sea and uh, now uh, this is limited to maybe some 10 percent of initial capacity via the ports which still have some access uh, and, and can operate and uh, also the uh, rail and uh, road uh, um, capacity is uh, limited because the rail prioritizes military uh, military shipments, military logistics, and there is also significant movement uh, of uh, uh, people migration uh, on, in Ukraine, especially it was in the first uh, months of, of war. So uh, the um, capabilities of uh, exports and of uh, logistics are, are quite limited, and this is one of key points. And um, uh, in this respect, I would also note that we have recent developments that uh, grain from occupied territories uh, is uh, which which cannot be exported, which could not be exported uh, by sea, is now moved to Russia and um, we know that some reputable agri traders are now re refusing to buy this grain and uh, this uh, leads to significant discounts and this poses a big risk not only for Ukraine but for the whole world uh, whole world because of global food crisis which is coming I think my colleague Oleg Niewieski may develop on this because it's primary his focus so uh, I will move on uh, imports in Ukraine uh, decreased to like one third of the pre-war volumes uh, because uh, there was a heavy ban on, on imports and uh, currency controls which are imposed to uh, stabilize uh, Ukrainian currency and uh, trade balance and which worked. We, we will come to it a bit uh, later in detail. So uh, inflation was quite significant, was four and a half percent in March. It's monthly inflation. So the annual figure it was will very likely increase, uh, will be higher than 15 percent. But uh, well, the inflation is now for going to be also the problem uh, for Europe as well and for uh, for all of the developed world. Um, banking sector, which is crucial for uh, operating of the economy, which is crucial for um, Revival uh, due to swift actions from uh, national regulator, from national bank, uh, banking sector 
uh, survived and survived well. Uh, uh, of course, uh, there are um, banks report that um, 50 to 70 percent of uh, cash flow from their loan portfolio is now like non-existent. There is a pro problem, a significant problem, problem with collaterals uh, which were damaged or which are located on occupied territories. So. Uh, there will be problems for banks later uh, with uh, recovering a lot of bad debts and uh, managing it. Uh, but uh, as of now, the banking system is working. It is also used uh, to support the business, which, which I will also touch a bit later. And uh, the payments are working, and this is crucial because uh, uh, business in Ukraine and uh, people in Ukraine uh, feel that uh, this normalcy, uh, you can pay by card uh, as uh, as it was before war, uh, the cash transfers are working, everything is working, and it is very significant uh, for uh, restoration of uh, business activity, especially for uh, small and medial business, uh, which, which suffers from a lot of other limitations as well. Uh, currency depreciation is uh, still negligible, so the uh, official rate is fixed uh, and there are a lot of currency limitations. Uh, but uh, we have to, I have to, to stress that uh, black market or unofficial currency market uh, differs from official exchange rate by no more than 10%, which indicates uh, that uh, currently uh, macroeconomic situation is quite uh, healthy if we can say say this word uh, applicable to to current situation of course and of course investments are frozen uh, they will uh, well they will not rebound without uh, major security improvement uh, or let's say ending of, of uh, active war activities and uh, even later the investment is not likely to rebound without some special uh, insurance policies which would uh, provide some uh, insurance for uh, business that they will not lose uh, their assets and their investment. Um, Together with Kyiv School of Economics uh, uh, and uh, consortium of uh, other other participants, we are now act actively working on assessing physical damages in Ukraine. Uh, this is like a rapid uh, damages assessment, uh, which uh, primarily uh, its primarily primarily purpose is to to understand the, the extent of damages and uh, how uh, the policy uh, actions and uh, further. Mm, economical help should be targeted, uh, and uh, as of as of now, uh, as of recent uh, weekly report, which is issued issued weekly and uh, can be followed, uh, there are over uh, 88 billion of direct uh, physical damages to uh, Ukrainian economy. Uh, uh, it's good that uh, the share of affected regions in GDP is lesser than uh, there were some initial estimates, so it's not 50%, it's uh, up to 30%. And uh, with the occupation of uh, central Ukraine, uh, this impact of war is is decreasing for 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 this territory. So the main the main negative impact is of course Kharkiv and Donetsk Oblast, which uh, were which which are and were big economical and industrial centers. If if I um, go to shop and take uh, like any second or set good in uh, uh, in food retail or uh, some other goods i i often see that uh, it is from Kharkiv region and i i am always happy to to see if to see these goods uh, produced uh, after after the beginning of the war to to have some confirmation that at least some business are still working and trying to uh, to maintain its operations um And this is the map. It, it, it's uh, as of beginning of the April, uh, the, but it can give you um, um, some understanding on on the damages uh, which were done. The, the top 500 uh, um, damages by 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 volume are mapped here, and you can see that not only uh, these damages are in the uh, war affected regions uh, near near the. Um, Near the lines, uh, but uh, also in, in Western Ukraine, because of course there are some uh, missile strikes, uh, which also uh, which also affect affect businesses. So uh, this is likely to continue putting its toll on uh, on Ukrainian economy. Uh, 
and uh, one of uh, another major factors for um, uh, business environment for economic is uh, effects uh, on human capital of course uh, uh, with, with current estimates, five uh, over five million uh, people fled the country, and um, United Nations uh, expect some three uh, three more millions to possibly flee. Um, and uh, as experience with previous uh, conflicts in, in this history shows, uh, some 40% of those who of those refugees, uh, they are not likely to return. Of course, this depends very much on um, what will be the state of uh, economy in Ukraine uh, after the war. And also, there are up to seven million of internally displaced uh, people, which um, of course uh, heavily impact. At, uh, the logistics and the um, transfer of goods uh, and everything within Ukraine. Uh, f f first, when this displacement started, there were a lot of like sh shortages of some goods, uh, were, were inflows of people. But uh, now uh, I would say that uh, infrastructure and economy adapted to this internally displaced, uh, uh, this big figure of internally displaced people. And of course, it should be. Noted that uh, the vast majority of refugees uh, who fled the country are women and, and uh, children and girls. Uh, so uh, th this also this also impacts uh, maybe the estimates of uh, how much will return, and um, this puts stress on businesses which are still working because uh, because uh, they need employees. Uh, there there is constant deficit for. Uh, manufacturing for uh, drivers uh, for for many many positions, and uh, businesses strive to to somehow find find this this employees and involves. Uh, policy response uh, policy response was timely and it was quite radical and it was first of all aimed to. Uh, relieve business from stress uh, and uh, give it the opportunity to somehow maintain its operations. So the the biggest change was that uh, basically all business in Ukraine, uh, with some few exceptions, was allowed uh, to go to simplified taxation system, which was previously uh, designed and targeted for small business with some uh, limitations on turnover. So now uh, most of the business uh, which doesn't work with uh, excise goods uh, can uh, choose can choose and voluntarily uh, go to simplified taxation and only pay two percent sales tax two percent from the reported turnover um, and uh, do not pay VAT uh, and um, for some businesses it uh, decreases uh, tax burden significantly and also VAT free imports uh, were introduced uh, this is quite a uh, questionable move. Uh, it uh, certainly helped a lot at the beginning uh, of this crisis uh, uh, to avoid deficits and uh, to keep uh, prices from growing significantly, uh, decreased inflation. Uh, but of course, it comes at the price of uh, significantly lower tax revenues to uh, budget and um, it significantly changes uh, economic incentives uh, for imports. Uh, so maybe some of you noted that there is a lot of imports, for example, of uh, cars now on the uh, border, western border of Ukraine. Not all of these cars, uh, cars are imported um, to uh, be transferred to Ukrainian army. A lot of this is like private initiative but uh, well on the other hand uh, private car is now uh, very important for um, sometimes for survi survival of ukrainians uh, because uh, people use cars to to flee the war zones uh, uh, they use them to um, navigate through ukraine where not everywhere the uh, pre-war logistics uh, remains so with buses trains etc etc so i would say that uh, private transport is now of, of even more importance in ukraine than it was previously also uh, fuel excises uh, uh, fuel VAT was decreased to seven percent uh, it also helped to keep uh, fuel prices 
not growing, uh, not, not skyrocketing, uh, and uh, this is also important for Ukrainian economy. Uh, I see that uh, I am speaking for a lot of time now, so I will be moving further. Uh, significant also changes uh, are the um, simplification of labor code. Uh, code. Uh, it's like easing the burden on employers uh, and uh, further changes in this uh, directions are expected. Uh, direct business support from the state. Uh, uh, there was a Ministry of, Econ of, of, of Economy introduced program to relocate businesses. As of now, uh, more than 500 applications were received and uh, over 200 businesses already relocated to Western Ukraine and working. Uh, I uh, attended some of these businesses myself and see uh, how, how they adapt to, to the new reality. Uh, state uh, authorities uh, try to provide transportation means for relocation. They uh, help to uh, find uh, new uh, facilities for relocation, especially uh, with in cooperation with local authorities who uh, who are very helpful with this because uh, they are also interested to invite uh, working businesses uh, to their regions. Uh, so this program is uh, is is uh, getting getting the momentum now. Uh, also, state has uh, introduced um, uh, significant financial support in the form of uh, zero interest rate loans for refinance and investment. Um, uh, it also uh, covers the interest rate uh, for agriculture loans for up to half a year to to, to help uh, this agricultural business to finance its needs. And uh, these programs are also working now. Uh, we have the feedback from especially state banks and uh, larger banks that uh, the loans are issued and they keep uh, business uh, afloat and keep working. Um, and also there is considered a program of a portfolio of state guarantees for bank loans to SME so that um, state would provide partial guarantees to banks who um, provide loans to small and medium uh, businesses so that uh, to, to decrease the risk assessment of banks to stimulate them uh, provide loans to, to small and medium business. Um, I, I will not focus now on uh, monetary policy and currency regulations, maybe uh, to, to this extent, uh, uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, this, this part was uh, done by uh, National Bank of Ukraine and by government quite swiftly and uh, efficiently and uh, we have a working uh, financial system uh, which is, which is uh, um, uh, crucial for, for our economy now. Uh, fiscal gap, that, that's the price uh, of war and that's the price of um, decreasing, um, decreasing the taxation burden. Uh, the most, uh, the, the newest estimates from National Bank of Ukraine uh, say that uh, there is 5 billion uh, fiscal gap. So it means that every month uh, Ukrainian budget has a gap of 5 billion uh, dollars which needs to be financed somehow. And uh, of course it is very important that uh, uh, the minimum of this f uh, f fiscal gap should be financed uh, by, uh, should be monetized, uh, uh, should be financed by emission because uh, larger emission would, would lead to inflation and to devaluation of uh, Ukrainian currency. And uh, as of uh, April, uh, National Bank of Ukraine has already bought like 50 billion dollars, uh, 50 billion hryvnias uh, in uh, state war obligations. And this is basically equal to emission. Uh, so uh, in, in, in this aspect we are, are now very dependable on uh, timely uh, foreign financial support uh, because uh, even the basic needs now uh, can be financed only, only with that uh, and uh, it, it puts some uh, significant pressure. So. Um, Policy outline for the future. Uh, this, this, these are the closing sites. Uh, domestic policies. What what is crucial now uh, to to summarize uh, to stimulate restoration of business activities and employment uh, in in safer regions of Ukraine. Uh, I think that most of this deregulation which was introduced will be kept after the war, and uh, all the regulatory system should be reconsidered uh, because. Uh, First of all, we need f fast economic growth and restoration of business uh, to, to support the economy. 
so closing the fiscal gap, which which uh, which I just mentioned, uh, and um, logistical issues. Uh, here we need to work a lot of uh, with EU to to ensure that we ship as much as possible uh, of goods and service uh, of, of goods uh, via railroads and uh, via uh, automobile roads and uh, use the uh, capabilities of uh, maritime logistics which is still still available but uh, but not a lot uh, for for the international policies of course it, first of all we we, we need now this um, urgent and prompt financing and uh, of course preferably in form of grants instead of loans uh, not to put uh, ex ex excess pressure on uh, ukrainian economy as of now, uh, Ukraine has fulfilled all, all its obligations um, on the debts, uh, uh, but of course uh, some restructuring is possibly coming because it is not uh, feasible to, uh, to 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 pay uh, to to fulfill all the obligations in in future to to return uh, foreign loans in 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 dollars and in euros. So I. I mm, I know that uh, these discussions are now going on with creditors uh, of Ukraine to find the mutually suitable uh, solutions for this. And of course, what is crucial in uh, the, the last uh, the last point is that um, swift, swift uh, integration of Ukraine uh, with EU is very important uh, from all aspects. First aspect is economical one, and uh, a few days ago it was announced that the EU considers lifting all limitations on uh, Ukrainian exports uh, in forms of custom duties and uh, other limitations and it will be very significant and direct uh, help for Ukraine for Ukrainian business to uh, not ask for financial help, but to earn money and to provide uh, uh, employment, and this is uh, this is a very big step. Uh, and other other aspects is that uh, EU candidate st status and integration into EU will provide. Uh, uh, like policy framework and institutional f framework for uh, rebuilding Ukraine and uh, for um, stable and uh, stable institutions and also um, uh, helpful in fighting corruption, which uh, uh, will still probably be the issue, especially in in such uh, volatile times uh, as as now and uh, as it will be in 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 future. Uh, so uh, this is uh, this is it. Thank you for attention. Sorry for taking uh, more time that that I was granted, uh, and we'll be glad to answer your questions later and in the discussion. Thank you very much, Yuri, uh, for an interesting presentation. Indeed, we will uh, have a short session, Q and A session, and a discussion session after all of the speakers. So at this point, we move on to Sofia Huzanko, who is an um, who is a manager at uh, the major international consulting firm. She has extensive experience in uh, private equity. Uh, she has been doing consulting work uh, for for a long time, and I think she has really interesting and uh, insightful comments and the thoughts to share with us when it comes to big business and investors and their reaction to the current situation, the war. Sofia, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, hello everyone. Um, thanks a lot uh, for having me here. Uh, I guess, uh, you know, today I'm going to break a bit of stereotype of uh, consulting professionals because, you know, typically we bring lots of PowerPoint slides and today I'm going just to speak. So no slides, uh, also will be uh, a bit, uh, we'll try to be a bit more concise, so maybe um, allow for more time for Q&A later. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to talk about, uh, about state of uh, large enterprises and also investments in Ukraine. Uh, and I think very naturally, uh, we'll build a lot on what uh, Yuri al already said, because uh, I mean, um, naturally, um, state of the overall Ukrainian economy is very tightly connected with how uh, enterprises are doing and, you know, uh, how also um, prospects for investments look. Uh, so before I go into detail, I'd like to um, recap a few um, really critical uh, figures, in my view. 
Uh, and one would be, you know, GDP of Ukraine in 2021, uh, which I think was around uh, 200 billion US dollars. Uh, second figure would be, you know, expected uh, decline of GDP uh, this year, uh, which is estimated between 40 and 50 percent. Um, so basically direct damages from Russian invasion uh, um, around 90 billion uh, and together with indirect losses it's around 600 billion so I think just looking on these figures you can imagine you know <laughs> drastic effects that war is going to have and I think you mentioned um, all the different factors that would um, lead to it and again maybe as a really quick summary of some uh, negative factors I would say you know number one um, big damage to uh, specific assets and infrastructure, right? Like lots of plants have been destroyed, roads, uh, bridges. So all of that, you know, would take a uh, long time to, to rebuild, even if uh, money uh, were not a constraint. Uh, so I think that's one. Second, I would say it's a big uh, demographic movement. And that's, uh, yeah, I think also really huge factors. So, so again, you know, we already lost 5 million people who fled to other countries, three more um, may come as well. And then lots of also people moved internally. Um, and what's even more uh, dangerous is that basically many of these people can be lost forever, right? So I think um, what uh, um, many experts are saying that especially if war continues be beyond, uh, you know, autumn, that's when uh, many, many children will go to school. So then, you know, <laughs> mothers basically will be even less uh, likely to come. Uh, plus, it would also give more time for, you know, women mainly who fled the country to find jobs. So basically, you know, the longer time they have to settle here, start new lives, the less likely uh, they are uh, to return later. Um, and again, of course, it would also um, be affected by probably two main factors. Number one, how long the war uh, is going to uh, continue. And secondly, uh, what effects the war would have and, you know, what would be um, the end state of the war, right? Like to which extent, you know, Russia would be weakened and we will be um, ensured that, let's say, another war <laughs> does not start. Uh, any, uh, anytime soon. Uh, so that would be second. And then um, among other maybe secondary effects, uh, I would also mention just, you know, fewer loss of income of people, jobs, you know, propensity to spend money on non-critical items, also some secondary uh, macroeconomic effects like uh, inflation, like likely currency depreciation. So I would say, you know, all this, of course, would also impact both uh, uh, large enterprises and uh, investments. Uh, of course, you know, fortunately, there are also some positive changes. And again, I think Yuri uh, mentioned many of those, but just to summarize, I would probably have, you know, three main blocks. So two main blocks. Number one is, you know, state support uh, of Ukraine, of Ukraine, both to people uh, and also to enterprises. I, I think indeed, you know, all those um, initiatives to lift taxation, to implement deregulation, of course, are helpful. Uh, and secondary, uh, potentially even more important is, of course, you know, uh, all, all the foreign support we are getting already. Um, already now, and I think post-war, that support would be critical, of course, as well. Um, again, you know, running a bit ahead, of course, if uh, Ukrainian aspirations to join, let's say, the, Euro the, European, uh, the European Union uh, realize, then, you know, it, it would be a totally different story versus, you know, if Ukraine, again, um, has to rebuild itself, like, mainly on, on its own. So that, that's a big game changer. Um, having said that, uh, let's maybe move on to specific, you know, major sectors of Ukraine and looking a bit on uh, potential impact uh, across those sectors. Um, I looked uh, on top 100 um, 
enterprises in Ukraine that uh, you know Forbes publishes every year. Uh, so last year, those top 100 uh, enterprises had total revenues of around uh, 84 billion US dollars. So quite a lot, and they grew also um, by 8%. Mm, some bigger sectors that we have is, you know, one is uh, metallurgy, and here I'm talking about, you know, such companies that, as Metinvest, uh, ArcelorMittal, Forex, for, and some other. A second would be agriculture, uh, Kernel, a a MHP, Nibelon, uh, and then we also have retail. Mm, chains like HB, Ford Group, Epicent, uh, Rosetka. We have energy sector, pharma, oil and gas, and so on. Um, uh, and I think, you know, later today, uh, we are supposed to uh, go deeper into agro and IT, but let me maybe uh, still cover, like, on a high level, some of um, impacts. So if you talk about metallurgy, I really liked, you know, um, one chart that you represented about top five damaged industrial assets because immediately there I spotted, you know, top two were actually from metallurgy in, in Mariupol and, you know, total damage is three billion. So you can imagine how can we talk about uh, development and, and Metinvest is also number one, like the largest uh, enterprise in Ukraine. So suddenly it lost, you know, its two largest assets. So as you can imagine, you know, impact is uh, huge. Uh, fortunately, you know, uh, owner Renata Ahmeta is also the richest uh, person of Ukraine and, you know, his partner is Sergei Tarut. I think they are uh, determined to invest and rebuild those assets. So hopefully it happens and uh, it gives, you know, potential upside to also modernize them. Uh, as you know, we had the problem in Ukraine, many assets are pretty outdated, not, not in line with international standards. However, um, again, I think they would benefit a lot uh, if there is support from both Ukrainian state and uh, foreign organizations. Uh, running a bit ahead, you know, and talking um, about investments, I don't think that private investments, you know, immediately would come. I mean, just purely uh, risks would be, you know, too high. And always, you know, first, I think state international organizations should come first. You know, hopefully, something similar to Marshall Plan uh, would be suggested. I know uh, EU Commission already mentioned it. Um, so, yeah, I think if that actually happens, that would help a lot for sure. And as, you know, State support comes first. Uh, I'm sure private investments will follow, especially if such mechanisms as, let's say, state guarantees, you know, co-investments, maybe some sort of public-private partnerships uh, come in place. I think, um, yeah, for sure it would become real. Um, maybe one other positive factor that I did not mention, but which is important and uh, to maintain is, you know, perception of Ukraine as a country, you know, both in Europe and abroad, I think that perception became much more positive, right? Like response of a state, of a president, of officials. And, you know, as long as we maintain um, that reputation, being, you know, a trustworthy partner, uh, you know, being um, uh, fully dedicated to also help rebuild country. I think um, this would, of course, impact the uh, willingness of other countries to participate and invest because many investments would be long term and wouldn't bring uh, return fast. Uh, so going to other sectors, I think agro is another one. And here, again, you know, Yuri mentioned uh, it's a major problem. I think actually that's a sector that would affect not only Ukraine, but also the whole world the most, right? We're already talking about you know, many um, risks for the globe, you know, in, in terms of hunger, in terms of uh, uh, lack of access to uh, food supplies, uh, increasing prices. Um, and here it's as simple as that, you know, Russia would not just allow exports, right? So grain is there, food supplies are there, ports are blocked. So basically all these uh, supplies <laughs> are just stuck there and not clear. Maybe they, they will be damaged and would need to be simply thrown away. So I think that's a major problem. And that's, of course, something that uh, international support uh, 
to, to really resolve it given huge impact on the rest of the world would, would, would be helpful. Um, I think my colleagues who would go deep into agro can cover it in more detail. And now the impact like uh, a bit longer term is, you know, this current uh, season. So of course also not all the area can be properly, you know, um, uh, how to say, so fields on, let's say, occupied territory, so where warfare is going on, of course, uh, cannot be cult cultivated, so that would also have impact on uh, next year and afterwards, with all, also all the mines and uh, everything. Um, then the retail, also very interesting. I think, you know, for food retail, maybe impact would be slightly less. I mean, these are critical products, so people will, will would still spend, at least those people who are still in Ukraine. However, for companies, let's say, selling electro consumer electronics, um, impact would be much, much bigger. And already we see that, number one, you know, many of those countries had uh, warehouses not far from Kiev that were looted. So all the products were just taken by uh, Russian soldiers. I also looked a bit deeper on one specific company, which is Rosetka. Um, and uh, yeah, the impact is just huge and disastrous. So they used to have revenues of around USD um, 140 million and revenues went down basically to uh, 10 million US dollars. So you can imagine more than 100 times down. Uh, they lost almost all their warehouses, 25 stores have to dismiss people. So yeah, all of that is, is really a long-term effect. So yeah, no, not very clear how they're going to rebuild it. That's um, very sad realities that we currently have to live with. And maybe to finish, I'll touch briefly on uh, IT outsourcing. So it seems from the first glance that this um, uh, sector shouldn't be so much affected. However, I would argue that it's not totally true because, you know, for IT outsourcing, it means, you know, uh, IT specialists serve many large banks and enterprises for really critical IT systems. And these international companies want their specialists to be located in safe locations, you know, with low risks. So uh, for Ukraine to be considered now as a high risk country can impact those, those businesses as well, because their clients may just demand that, okay, we don't want uh, us, our critical systems to be served out of Ukraine. And I, I, I personally see a big risk there. Not sure if it's already been realized or, or not yet, uh, but, um, at least something to take into account. Uh, and maybe, yeah, being cautious of time, before I finish, um, just saying one last thing about investments, I already covered a bit. I think overall, um, my focus in business is private equity, and this industry was underdeveloped in Ukraine for a long time. Uh, so after the war, um, as I mentioned, I don't think it, uh, large PE investments would come immediately. First, it has to be some sort of, you know, uh, public investments, maybe public-private um, partnerships. Uh, infrastructure, I think, could be attractive uh, area. So some infrastructure funds. Uh, and then large PE VC investments would probably follow later when uh, there is uh, higher assurance uh, that Ukraine is stable, that the risk of another war is low, uh, that uh, there is you know, state support and everything. So that's, I think, the point when uh, more investments would come. So yeah, let, let, let me finish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sofia, for your insightful comments uh, and, this, uh, and these points that you raised. Uh, now we uh, move on to Yaroslav Krimpovich, who will discuss the IT sector in particular in Ukraine. Uh, Yaroslav here is um, a specialist uh, in, uh, in startups. He has extensive experience in working in uh, startups and managing startups, focusing especially on uh, tech and AI driven firms. So Yaroslav, the floor is yours. So maybe I'll just add on that. So I'm also kind of part of this funky part of private equity, which is called venture capital. And I'm doing this for the eighth year already, developing ecosystems in Europe and in Poland specifically. So um, 
Uh, I would focus predominantly uh, on small and, med uh, small and medium enterprises and young enterprises in the ICT sector, especially startups, and touch a bit less about sourcing. So th thank you, Topia, for your remarks, and I will add on, on that in a second. However, so we've seen this story before, right? So the next startup nation, that the previous one would be the Israel. The same more or less situation, the country with the at some point failed economy and had been failing at the attracting foreign direct investments in the state of war. So uh, several people already said it today and uh, the, the GDP will probably uh, uh, fall down beyond 45% uh, and probably even more this year. However, if you look at the breakdown of our GDP, uh, the service uh, industry accounts for 61% in Ukraine. Uh, it, uh, and th that's healthy uh, European uh, economy compared to the 67% in Israel. However, if you look at the breakdown of service exports, the Ukraine part of the outsourcing ICT services and product services is only 6% compared to the countries like Israel, where the, 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 their breakdown is much larger. And looking at the current situation, we talked about the demographic changes and movement of people. So there are around 300,000 IT employees in Ukraine, around 200,000 uh, or 220,000 uh, programmers uh, compared to 330K in, in Israel. So from 50 to 70% of them are currently located in the two regions of Ukraine, in Lviv Oblast and the Karpaty Oblast. So uh, th this is a very significant factor. If you look at the, at the Poland, Poland houses around 250,000 programmers. Uh, this is like one third of London, one fourth of uh, Silicon Valley. So uh, as Sophia already touched uh, on the topic, the ICT industry mainly represented currently by the software houses and software outsourcing. They are more or less fine. They work at 80% of the capacity. They obviously have some issues and they had some issues for the past year with uh, companies moving critical infrastructure out of the country. And that was the trend since the COVID started actually. Uh, but those are mainly uh, financial logistical parts of the business. Still the 80% of the the contracts are being maintained. The company that most lost on are those that served Russian markets. So the, the ones that served American and European markets are the contracts are still uh, still in use. So 45% of the workforce uh, in Ukraine ICT services is employed through outsourcing companies. So that the other part are either freelancing or working product companies. And the product companies is the main focus uh, of my today, uh, since they create the, the additional added value for the uh, service export. So how do you, uh, how do somebody stimulate, how the country stimulate the government, stimulate the ICT industry in, in, in Ukraine? And that was done quite a few times before. So it started on, uh, I'm teaching venture capital as well, in, as well university. So I like to, to uh, have a look back at the history. So the, the first case was when the Sputnik satellite was developed by USSI and Eisenhower administration set up several agencies like DARPA, NASA, but also uh, introduced Small Business Investment Act. So that set up the um, set of uh, institutions that, that through specific engines like banks, NGOs, and investment corporations started investing in small and medium enterprises to, to innovate the uh, sector in the United States. So the, some of the results uh, cannot be overestimated. Uh, that Apple was founded basically this way, Intel, FedEx, Tesla, Costco, iRobot, Ben & Jerry, all of them at some point got uh, some, percent, some part of the loans from this scheme and it uh, consisted from two main parts so they were uh, split it into the investments where the private investors uh, private equity individual uh, wealthy individuals uh, contributed into the schemes where were from the part of small business administration they contributed the uh, government guaranteed debt for every dollar of private capital 
So uh, the maximum amount of those funds were roughly 150 million. And that resulted in the majority of world now and venture capital funds that exist today. So they actually learned through this scheme. The first their investments were, were done through this scheme and so on. So uh, the other part of the uh, of the equation that, that was first introduced in states were the loan program, and I'm, I'm very pleased to see that how Ukrainian government introduced uh, some of the stimulation packages for small and medium enterprises through uh, financing SMEs through loans. Uh, three main types of the loans used till from 60s till today in states is uh, loan guarantee program up to 5 million US dollars uh, express loan program that introduced the financing within 36 hours and fixed asset purchase loans. So uh, uh, as I understand currently in Ukraine is employed uh, the, the third one uh, and some variation of the, uh, of the operational loan program. So uh, and why I started talking about the SBA because uh, there is a lot of long history that the, of the things happening, so we, we can create, create, we can analyze really well documented longitudinal studies. So if you look in the perspective, and and the agency invested in various businesses, from startups to the long term businesses that that existed for for over a decade, and if you see, uh, and that's controlled for the other factors involved, and uh, the the biggest impact of the uh, fund allocated was actually in startups and companies that existed under six years. So they were able to increase their sales the most. They were able to increase the the job opportunity, the job creation the most compared to the other types of entities. And that's the case of uh, states, and that there are other examples. So one of the most prominent ones are Yosma. So this was a governmental program in Israel, which focused on uh, contributing a small fund of 100 million US dollars for 15 uh, institutions, which then invested in the further uh, companies for the startup. So uh, that was where a drop down fund. So majority of the risk were taken by the government. After five years, the government also offered the investors to buy out the governmental share at predetermined, predetermined conditions. So uh, as a result, out of, out of 15 companies either uh, went public or were acquired. Uh, majority of the funds, like nine out of 10 funds, they, they bought back their option that they have invested, that the government has investment invested uh, and the Israel venture capital industry was established for, uh, within the first six years uh, of the operation. The VC funding in Israel accounted from zero in, 2000, in 1993 to 26 billion in 2021. And uh, that's basically a chronology of governmental interve intervention. There's really a small tactical investment of $100 million that uh, resulted in the snowball that we see as really IT and ICT industry today. And there are similar programs in Europe as well. So the, uh, the case of Jerem Jeremy program, the Joint European Resources for Micro to Medium Enterprises uh, showcast how the countries, starting from Greece, Romania, Latvia, Lithuania, and some of the regions like Campania, Sicily, uh, uh, Malta, Calabria, Cyprus, Slovakia, how they uh, incorporation with European Investment Bank and European uh, uh, Investment Fund have established. Uh, entities that invest in the SMEs, in both in terms of the equity, loan, guarantees, uh, controlled through the revol revolving holding fund in form of EAF. So that works predominantly in a way that uh, European Commission established managing authority uh, and holding fund that takes the role of EAF that later on uh, defines the uh, financial intermediaries that uh that allocates specific funding for the SMEs. And the uh, call to action is actually a pretty straightforward. So the, the uh, invest, European Investment Bank was investing in the countries of Eastern Partnership for a while now. 
there there were uh, there, there were already several discussions within uh, within the authorities, uh, how, uh, and the relatively small part of the funds that previously, even before the war, were investing in the country, could contribute really a large change in the uh, job opportunities and. Uh, Potential for the result that is missing in the country, so it could it will facilitate the rapid creation of job opportunities. It will facilitate the creation of new VC funds and uh, help of the previous ones that exist already. Uh, and uh, why this is more super important right now, uh, and taking comparison countries such as Poland, where I'm developing this ecosystem for the past eight years. So since 2000s, Polish Agency for Support of the Entrepreneurship, they sp uh, spent 10 billion euros to, to finance SMEs in Poland. Uh, the two other agencies for, for which I also worked for a while, the Polish Development Fund and National Fund for R&D, jointly allocated 650 million euros for investments in Polish startups since 2013. But if you compare the, the ecosystems of the, uh, those uh, fast, fast growing businesses, in 2020, uh, Ukraine early stage startups gathered 32 million US dollars, while Polish ones gathered 50 million US dollars in comparison. So the uh, Ukrainian ecosystem is, is extremely well developed. There are well established uh, VC operators. That there are large companies like Grammarly, Macpo, Riddle, and others. Uh, so comparing companies like Grammarly with extremely high margin with industrial com industrial complex companies like Metinvest. It's like one fifth uh, or, or, or of its its uh, net revenue. So, why it's also very important right now, because from as I already mentioned in the beginning, from fifty to seventy percent of Ukrainian IT employees are gathered in two regions. So this is extremely closed and closed space. Majority of them, seventy percent, according to the questionnaires, will stay there. They will be, they will uh, develop their companies down there. That they will create local communities. They, they will further develop the ecosystem, especially the people from the places like Kharkiv, where uh, many people who graduated from Krasin uh, Institute, who later on went to large software houses and large IT companies, they 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 they, 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 they are determined to stay in the. Lviv uh, region, especially, so uh, that creates the extremely uh, interesting opportunity for the um, for the creation for the further further development of the local ecosystem of the ICT companies in the west of the Ukraine, and. Uh, Again, the confirming the, the, the thesis that Ukraine is not only a very potential, uh, so it's, it's not only potentially very feasible next candidate for the being the next startup nation uh, and developing this industry and country even further. We already did that and we're already in very high places uh, in terms of, the, for example, how many companies in, uh, how many unicorns were funded by the uh, by the Ukrainian people eventually. So uh, we are in 10th place uh, by the number of the CEOs uh, born in Ukraine uh, that are managing US-based unicorns. Uh, so at this uh, note, I would end my short presentation. So that was mostly not uh, reflecting on the uh, on the current state of the things, but providing uh, some kind of ideas for framework for the further development. And I would gladly pass my word further. Thank you very much, Yaroslav, uh, for this interesting and insightful presentation and for the solution that you also offered for the future. And now we move on to uh, Oleg Niewiewski, who is from Kiev School of Economics, and um, he also a coordinator of the UA Food Trade Research Project, and uh, he has extensive experience in uh, agricultural sector, both research-wise, but also uh, in in other capacities. So, Oleg, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. 
Thank you, Olga, and thank you to all of you. Uh, let me share my perspective on, on, on agriculture, Ukrainian agriculture, and and what's going on there, and uh, you know some repercussions that it has. The current war with Russia has on local uh, economy and on the global food security, basically. So I would focus on two uh, dimension, dimensions of that, uh, local and global. <clears throat> Locally, agriculture, if upstream and downstream sectors are accounted for, the overall contribution of this complex of this sector would be around 22%. So fifth of Ukrainian income is coming from agriculture and related, uh, and related sectors. So the role is quite important. And in terms of export revenues, uh, agri-food is generating about more than 40%, at least it generated more than 40% of, uh, of total revenues, total export revenues uh, for Ukraine. Majority of this 40% is basically grain and oil crops and vegetable oil. So it's about 30%. So uh, that's why, uh, you know, export capacity or export uh, is quite important for Ukraine and for um, for um, ports, basically. The, the ports and, and seaborne train is quite important because usually the most economically viable way of exporting such a low value products like grain and oil crops and, 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 and oil and vegetable oil is basically seed trade. Other ways of uh, alternative ways of exporting this stuff are, are not that, um, yeah, attractive. I would say <laughs> it's 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 simply just too costly. That's why uh, there is a uh, there's, there's too much uh, not not too much, but uh, a lot of uh, focus now is going on on the on on what's happening in Ukrainian ports. They are blocked right now, and exports are not uh, possible from Ukraine. Uh, through the ports uh, and alternatives from uh, through the railways and uh, some uh, the export by trucks that's that's possible but you know it's 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 really in limited uh, capacity and you cannot really export though that substantial amount of grain and oil crops and um, and, and oil vegetable oils as, as we had when, when ports were available this is very crucial and then uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna focus that on that uh, a bit later when I'll be talking about the outlook of perspectives okay but one thing um, and uh, uh, you know uh, we export that stuff basically to low income countries like uh, Middle East and Northern Africa uh, low income countries and without our grain Ukrainian grain, uh, that's uh, that's going to be really humanitarian crisis over there. And many people that work in food security area are really calling right now up that there's going to be a hunger in some of the countries. Uh, and uh, this is quite serious, especially taking into account that Russia is competing uh, with us on that uh, on that markets uh, and uh, the situation in Russia is also is also not that good, I would say, because sanctions and uh, you know the the overall perception of Russia as a, a terrorist uh, is kind of making uh, has its own price. Okay, so the export is purchased at, at substantial discount. Some of the traders, as Yuri already mentioned, refuse to buy uh, the the grain with the blood. And uh, I mean, it makes uh, uh, it affects substantially. So coupled with Ukraine, uh, these countries will be suffering even more. OK, uh, with, um, uh, combining the fact that Russia also exports to, to those countries. So <clears throat> overall, the war um, has not just uh, a substantial impact locally uh, to Ukraine, on to Ukraine, but also globally. To especially to the country that depends too much of uh, from Ukrainian uh, grain, uh, so it has uh, it has that such uh, big important importance. Um, we made uh, some uh, calculations um, uh, on our side uh, on the level of losses and damages uh, that Ukrainian agricultural agri food sector is now suffering uh, just recently we published uh, so fo published uh, basically this estimates the very first estimates that we contributed a lot to that uh, policy note so the damages are accounted now uh, estimated now at about 6 billion us dollars 
uh, and uh, losses are about 22 billion US dollars. So quite substantial amount. And um, <clears throat> on the same on this at the same time, uh, the planting season is going well. Uh, well, putting aside the territories that are right now uh, under the Russian occupation, which is Herston region, so the southern region and, and east. Uh, so the planting season is, is going well and, uh, you know, uh, there are uh, forecasts. There is a forecast that we, we're going to have a quite good harvest this year, despite all this uh, madness that's going on right now. Uh, I'm, I'm about 30% drop from the last year uh, level, but still that's a really substantial amount of grain will be available. Now the trick is, uh, is that <clears throat> we don't know what's going to happen with the ports. Because despite all the efforts that farmers are, uh, are doing right now, you know, planting in really unsecured um, areas, just right now, just today, I've seen uh, stories that tractors were really blown up on the Russian mines. Uh, fortunately, uh, nobody, I mean, the, the truck to drive didn't suffer, but I mean, this is the situation. So there are mines on the on the rural roads and, and this is really dangerous, even on the territory that, that were liberated recently from Russian occupation. I'm talking about Chernihiv region, basically, or was that Kyiv? Never mind, I mean, it's kind of in the north that now uh, not uh, occupied by Russia. This is really dangerous. And uh, despite this uh, substantial amount of efforts and and costs uh, to farmers, uh, you know, the, the, the harvest, the new harvest will be available in July already. And it needs to be uh, exported out of, out, out of the country. If that doesn't happen, there's going to be a substantial supply shock in Ukraine. Uh, of grain. I mean, we, we do have this supply shock right now, but that's that's going to be even more. In, in started in July, that means that there is a high risk that you know the agricultural sector will go will go bankrupt actually, because uh, there will be no kind of substantial price or revenues to compensate for the costs incurred uh, to the farmers. Uh, now, because of the uh, dist disrupted lo logistics. At the moment, because the you know grain should be right now channeled uh, through the railway to the ports of uh, Romania and Bulgaria and up to the north to um, to Poland and Gdansk, uh, the logistics costs of shipping of exporting grain for the farmers and traders increased by four times. So before war, uh, you know, to ship grain on average from the center of Ukraine to the to the Black Sea port, cost costed about uh, thirty dollars per ton. Thirty dollars per ton. Now uh, the costs are hundred and hundred and twenty dollars per ton. That means the uh, the farm gate prices for the farmers are quite low because you know all the logistics costs they basically roll down on the shoulder on the on the shoulders of the of the farmers because the uh, world market price is fixed. Uh, and what is what is happening right now? Uh, the farm gate prices now even lower than in pre-war time, even lower. That means you know farmers cannot get the you know the advantage of the current high uh, world, world market prices because I mean in, compared to the pre-war pre-war time uh, times um, you know the, the world market prices increased substantially by 30 percent. Uh, but the farm gate prices they are now even lower than the pre-war pre -war time. So quite. Uh, uh, you know, um, dangerous situation, and without solving this problem with the ports, uh, uh, um, th 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 there's high uncertainty in terms of how the uh, the agriculture will will develop in the in the, uh, in the future. Uh, I, tr I try to to take it positive because uh, you know uh, if I look back uh, you know, for for the last thirty years we had multiple of episodes of war with Russia. I mean, not really a military, but some economic wars. Like we remember dairy wars, uh, we remember some uh, sanitary and phytosanitary wars with Russia. And from all those um, uh, situations where they learned and what basically entrepreneurs in Ukraine learned that you know, it was a real help to diversify and to come up with something new. 
okay to uh, uh, for instance now uh, a lot of uh, people talking about well we have so much grain why don't we sort of try to diversify these export risks by processing more in the country okay so there is a there is a there is a there is a uh, discussion about that of course it's not easy uh, it, it 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 will need some it will need some capital it will need time it will need uh, you know human capital to to um to internalize the technology that is needed to find the markets uh, but it's possible okay and uh, moreover a uh, european union opens uh, a door quite widely for ukrainian uh, uh, for ukrainian exports uh, just re i think yuri mentioned about that that uh, you know we, we we will have actually free almost free trade <laughs> with the european union uh, uh, quite soon so that's an opportunity okay and that, that's an opportunity i'm sure our uh, entrepreneurs farmers will will take advantage of all We'll see how it's going to develop, but uh, you know these are you know the, the, the huge risk I see right now, but also I see uh, um, you know substantial potential for further development of agricultural sector and 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 food processing in Ukraine. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Oleg, for your uh, comments and for your thoughts on the agriculture in Ukraine. So let me now open a very short Q&A session because uh, we are running out of time. So maybe we will take 10, around 10, um, maximum 15 minutes to to dis for the discussion and to uh, the uh, questions and answers uh, session. So let me um, open this session with a question actually to, to Oleg because um, I was, when you were talking, and I was thinking about this, the river ports. What is the situation in Ukraine when it comes to river ports? Can we export our agricultural products via rivers to the European Union, for example? Yes, the, the new uh, way of shipping the grain is is is, uh, is quite a good option. But again, the the, the capacity that, that we have there is quite limited. So. It's not kind of tens, couple of tens of million tons of grain that could be shipped over there. No, it's just uh, some, you know, uh, I think, um, I don't remember exactly the figures, but it's up to one million, I think, tons of, of the grain that could be shipped. Maybe more, but I don't remember. But still, I mean, compared to the overall volume, it's it's really negligible. All right, so we still need to look for some other solutions. Uh, all right, so let me uh, just give the floor uh, to to all of you. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand, uh, you know, virtually, and then uh, and then you can ask your questions. Or maybe just share your thoughts. Uh, Roger, go ahead. Thank you. Well, I had a, the opportunity to say a lot at the start, so I, I just keep it short. But um, thank you for those um, wonderful presentations. I'm delighted we're recording the meeting. Um, and I think they were giving us very, very valuable insights indeed. Um, I, I have lots of questions, actually. But I mean, one question I have for Yuri was, um, and perhaps the others could comment on this as well, would be how important would some kind of debt forgiveness for Ukraine be, historic debt, if there was an international um, initiative? And it's something that happened for ju the Jubilee Debt Campaign, and a number of civil society organizations are talking about this. From an economic point of view, how, how valuable would that be? Um, and maybe just leave it at that, but I do have a couple of other questions as well if there's time uh, yeah if, if i heard you correctly uh, this this is very significant for ukraine uh, this debt forgiveness uh, but it should be understood that uh, a large share of this debt is a private one and with private uh, creditors uh, it, it should be negotiated maybe in the form of restructuring or post postponement uh, like it was done in 2014 uh, by uh, then uh, finance minister natalia yeresko who restructured uh, the debt uh, because of course, uh, 
despite all this uh, situation and uh, macroeconomic and security, uh, credibility is crucial for Ukraine. And uh, if if we cannot negotiate, uh, we, we need to fulfill these obligations. Uh, in this case, we should uh, rely on uh, um, relief from the depths of uh, international financial organizations and from their financial relief. With, with private, uh, this should be negotiated. So perhaps one of the things, if I come back on that, perhaps one of the things that, that should the call perhaps should be for a sort of um, a conference on on debt um, forgiveness rather than automatic forgiveness of debt because the question of how it's done. So while it would be helpful to cancel debt, how the debt is cancelled, how the arrangements are made is also going to have a very significant impact. If I if I've understood you correctly, so there ought to be a kind of to the extent there was a call from a coordinated call from civil society groups for debt forgiveness, it, it should be calling for a kind of conference on that, perhaps to look at that rather than direct for conference for, 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 for debt forgiveness itself. Would that would that be the the approach? Do you think? Yeah, that sounds a reasonable approach. And uh, as I know, uh, NBU governance and uh, Ministry of Finance are, are working on, on coordinated effort on this. Maybe Sofia Huzanko, who is raising hand, wants to add to this. Maybe she knows better. Yes, uh, there was one comment that uh, I was actually um, planning to say earlier, but I think it's closely related and there are already discussions ongoing. Uh, and it's um, about, you know, use of Russian assets, right, to yeah. repay, you know, both, uh, both debt and, you know, provide financing. Uh, I think already U.S. is talking about, you know, those uh, frozen assets of oligarchs and rich people to be redirected to Ukraine, but then they also have, you know, huge... Um, reserves of uh, Russian central bank, you know, some additional assets. So uh, I think for sure that would help if that goes forward. Uh, plus, of course, you know, after hopefully we win the war, uh, Russia should pay uh, big reparations, you know, for all the direct and indirect damage. And uh, we want to ensure that the international community, you know, supports us properly with this. Thank you, Roger. Do you have uh, more questions? Well, uh, perhaps here yeah, to, to Sophia. What about the the role of the um, Ukrainian diaspora and refugees? And is there any way in which um, you know uh, there, there, there may be kind of uh, payments paid back to? And what's the tax situation of people of Ukrainian citizens abroad? And is there any way in which um, you know uh, the diaspora? Can, uh, particularly if, uh, if if arrangements could be put in place within the European Union, for example, instead of taxing Ukrainian citizens in in, in Poland, allow their taxes to uh, be remunerated back to Ukraine. Is there any any discussions about that about uh, the, you know remittances from the diaspora and the refugees? Uh, so, so, to be honest, I'm personally not aware of such di uh, discussions. I know that in private capacity, of course, you know, naturally all Ukrainians abroad are helping, right? Both, you know, the army, humanitarian aid, you know, their direct relatives. For tax system, I see that uh, Yaroslav uh, also raised hand. Maybe he has something to add, but I I'm not aware of any discussions of this sort. So uh, a very interesting part. Uh, generally, there is huge population of uh, previously before the war. There was and still is huge population of uh, temporary workers in the European Union from Ukraine, which accounted uh, for uh, almost for six percent of GDP in terms of uh, if you count it as a direct foreign investment, right? So, right, so this, those remittances going directly to the families. Uh, so obviously changing the tax situation in this regards would be a, a game changer, definitely. Uh, but there is a huge diaspora all, all, all over the globe, one of the biggest ones in Canada and the States. Uh, in, in their tent, they help a lot as well, I know, from the humanitarian perspective and uh, uh, and from the army supply perspective as well. Uh, but I think your question was mostly uh, uh, about the, those are within the European Union. And yes, yeah, so if, if we count for the 6% of GDP as remittances, that, that would be a total game changer if we could uh, kind of 
have some kind of relief scheme or, or move their taxation back to Ukraine, for example. I know that there were some ideas, especially from the regional governments, uh, from the Western part, about the uh, schemes where Ukrainian employees uh, that work within the EU would actually work from the, some kind of intermediary that would pay Ukrainian taxes. Uh, so that that might be very interesting. So generally, yeah, uh, the, both both ideas about uh, relief for remittances and um, uh, paying taxes for for employees in Ukraine is very much on on the board and interesting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think Jan was next. Yes, well, thank you for all of your uh, presentation. It's uh, extremely insightful and 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 very relevant. I'm I'm just thinking of uh, um, maybe we should also have as uh, as a partner organization. Uh, maybe we should think of uh, putting some kind of uh, ongoing report on on this kind of c collecting all the data which we have and all the this insights, even in a short messages. But I think it's extremely important to keep the the record of this and, and then see how it's ongoing. So that that's just w w one thing which we can think in the in the future in terms of our activities. The other thing is just to what what Roger was saying about the the death uh, for. Forgiveness. I think the the and then having like a civil society strong advocacy voice on that and 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 calling for this uh, from from the grassroots uh, perspective. Um, I think that e e the, the something similar could happen, and it's it's actually striking because we have a lot of uh, actions, grassroots activities, or um, on the country base not to buy the Russian products. Uh, but it, it seems like uh, we should have uh, uh, simultaneous action or calls for, for explicitly buying Ukrainian products and promoting uh, in that way or helping Ukraine in that way, Ukrainian economy. Because, I mean, the figures you were presenting were, um, you know, that's, uh, yeah, we only talk about two months of, uh, of, um, uh, of, of, of war, which is, uh, as we see now, it's unlikely to end uh, uh, or, or has a definite solution in the near future. So um, if, if we want to, uh, I mean, that's another way of, of helping Ukraine, just deliberately to focus on helping uh, Ukrainian entrepreneurs uh, buying Ukrainian uh, buying Ukrainian products or um, uh, having Ukrainian services uh, which can be done online. So I guess it's it's a, it's, it's something which we could uh, also think as a form of uh, uh, you know st the, this grassroots activity and 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 see put this on our agenda that you know when when we talk with different organization with the different people uh, in um, in Europe uh, maybe that's that's something which which could be uh, an important part of, of, of our agenda too. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Jan. And uh, now we have a comment from Maria Laura and then Sofia. Oh, you are muted. Uh, Maria Laura, you are yeah. muted. Sorry. Yeah. Can you hear me? Um, I have just a question. Um, there are uh, all sorts of other services. I mean, you you just mentioned Yaroslav. You mentioned services that Ukrainians can do by being in Ukraine or moving, you know, uh, somewhere else. And one of the things that they, they can do in Ukraine is is producing children um, for other people. I mean, there, there's a big industry. That is what I, 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 I understand in Ukraine of women producing uh, children uh, as substitute mothers, etc. Is there a figure that you can give to this? Uh, or is, is that really relevant to, to deserve a figure or or not, I, I, something um, interesting to to know because it's uh, apparently uh, quite a lot of people uh, say it's one of the few countries where this um, uh, this is 
um, allowed. It, it's, uh, it can be done uh, openly without, uh, you know, being secret, etc. Um, if you don't have answers, don't worry, because probably there are no answers to this, but it's just a curiosity of a journalist that is uh, quite interested to know if it can be quantified. But many people talk about this. It cannot be quantified, probably. Um, I, I may take take a word quickly because we made a research project last year for biotech industry in Ukraine. So the surrogate mothership is uh, like only a small part of all the medical and biotechnology industry which uh, sparkled in Ukraine in recent years. So it's a biotech uh, which sparked due to need to provide uh, medical assistance to those injured in uh, in the war which, which onset in 2004. It's a lot of uh, stom uh, high-tech stomatological services. Uh, uh, it's a lot of medical trials for uh, Western companies, etc., etc. Uh, 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 Maria Laura, uh, I can share with you a presentation in English, uh, which uh, gives a very detailed picture of Ukrainian biotech industry wider than surrogate, surrogate mothership, and maybe to all others interested uh, in, in detail. But the problem is that. Uh, all, all of that industry, it uh, it needs uh, stability and security. So of course uh, now it's uh, totally on, on minimum on on zero, and a lot of uh, trials, medical trials projects, which are long term, which need uh, which require uh, to observe their patient patients who receive medications uh, until uh, their uh, lifespan uh, along their lifespan. It's it's now uh, close to zero, and uh, those uh, companies are more to to other countries so not all of that will be uh, easily reproduced but i can share this report with you just just provide me details perfect thank you yuri uh, so just to add a quick comment i think first of all um it is a very sensitive issue right now and it will be a very sensitive issue the surrogacy uh given that a lot of people have uh, have left the country and so we actually we need our people back and plus we have uh, as you may uh, hear a huge problem with rapes uh, coming from russian soldiers and now a lot of ukrainian women are actually pregnant uh because of that and so um that would be also a sensitive issue uh, currently in ukraine Ukraine. And plus, we have a, a, a ban on uh, adoptions uh, currently in the country because of the state of the war. So, uh, if anything happens like that and this, you know, surrogacy continues uh, to happen in Ukraine, then it has uh, to be the peaceful times because for now, adoption is not possible. Um, and now we also have Sofia. Sofia has uh, her hand raised. So, go ahead. Yes, uh, I had a, a quick comment and maybe also an idea for one of the future discussions, right? Because um, currently, as we speak about Ukraine, the war is still ongoing. Uh, so I think what happens with, with Ukraine in the future is very tightly connected with, you know, what happens in Russia. So when we talk about, you know, all the different measures that should be applied to, to Ukraine, both on the level of governments, businesses, just, you know, private people, I think we equally important to talk, you know, what we should do um, towards Russia, right? Uh, and uh, uh, I like, you know, Jan's uh, comment about uh, importance to buy brands and products from Ukraine. I think, again, you know, equally important is to boycott and avoid buying, you know, Russian products as well as those companies that chose to uh, stay in Russia, you know, be it Oshan or Leroy uh, Le Merlin and, you know, we know Nestle and some other. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, number one encouragement to all of you and number two, maybe a potential topic if you would like to have another yeah. session. I, I, of course, I, uh, I did say that this is uh, important that we have an action on, on, on not buying Russian products. I'm just saying that maybe we need an equal emphasis or even more emphasis on buying deliberately Ukrainian products. And I see this also like uh, as, uh, I mean, uh, if, if, we, if we use our partners uh, networks i think it's uh, it might be a good uh, good practical uh, initiative which we can take to start you know because that's that's also um, a 
like the barcodes, uh, identifying barcodes or identifying Ukrainian brands, which uh, which people can can think of. So it's it's just, uh, um, I mean, I, I think we shouldn't give up uh, emphasizing uh, what are the Russian products or what are the companies which uh, still cooperate with Russia. That's uh, it's absolutely necessary, but. Uh, uh, but it will not give uh, more money to Ukraine, and I think we need. The, I mean, the, one of the conclusion we have from from uh, from our uh, from our workshop today is that um, Ukraine will. Uh, mm, I mean, the, the the significance of um, that fiscal gap, uh, and then the the the, the budget uh, deficit will be uh, will be a significant problem in the near future. So. Uh, so it's um, not to mention the, the the war spending on war. So it's it's uh, I, I see this as, uh, as as something which we could uh, also uh, um, uh, advocate as um, as our so far small network. But you know we can expand. Thank you. So let's take the last two comments or questions. So the first was Roger, and then we will have uh, Volkank. So Roger, go ahead. very much um yeah i think a made in ukraine um tag or brand would be great and uh something very easy for civil society organizations like ours to push i just wanted to ask oleg it was so interesting all of the presentations um should the european union give some sort of subsidy trying to find a way to give a subsidy to ukrainian farmers i mean i, I was a little bit concerned about what you're saying about how they can't benefit from the uh higher world prices and so on and obviously um, if uh, farmers go out of business in Ukraine, um, it's not going to make uh, it's going to make a bad situation worse. To put it frankly, isn't it? So, how can the EU support Ukrainian farmers? And also, just say that thank you to Yaroslav about the because, as you said, or he, Yaroslav actually gave us a said something. Here's something that can be done. Yeah, came with a solution. Um, and could you just remind us what that is and how we can get behind it and support it? So, so me? Yes, Oleg, yeah, it's that, a question uh, to you about the mm -hmm. so I would address yeah. your question the following way. Yes, the the subsidy is is a possible way. Yeah. So the question was about the subsidies. Yes. Can you hear you, me? Yes, we can hear you. Can you Hello? hear us? Can you hear us? Probably there is there is a connection. Yes, I can hear you. Issue. Okay. So there is a delay. The connection is getting worse. The connection is getting worse. So the question was about subsidies. Yes. The question was about the subsidies, right? Subsidies the from European the European is, Yeah, yeah. That's <clears throat> actually um, th th that's a difficult question. Uh, I think that the subsidies is is a viable is is a viable option, and it's actually um, it's not actually available right now. Uh, in terms of kind of technical or in terms of um, support, uh, and, uh, and uh, I think subsidies should be uh, packaged in a way to give as much flexibility as possible to the farmers to, you know, to get advantage of the current environment. So that means the subsidies should not be structured in a way that, look, you have to do this and that, and, uh, and you have to produce this and that, you have to use these inputs, right? And that and input that they should be uh, quite flexible. There's no chat about that. No, those that's the first. That means I think something like a project financing uh, in terms of matching grants would be at least uh, uh, from my point of view and and a reasonable option of subsidies that could be channeled from the European Union to 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 <clears throat> Thank you, Oleg. Um, I hope uh, I hope the recording will be better because we had some connection yeah. issues. Um, but thank you for your answer. And now Volgang. 
Um, one uh, one sentence from my side. Thank you very much for all the presentations, and it shows how difficult uh, the economical uh, situation and solving the problem is uh, when the war is over and when we have a look of the results. Uh, when there is again uh, whatever cold uh, peace um, uh, in Ukraine, but on the other side, uh, uh, every uh, every very bad situation also. Uh, it's a chance, it's a chance to modernize uh, economy like we heard, and we should have a look what chances for Ukrainian, uh, for Ukraine is to, uh, when, when big, for example, German uh, firms or companies like BASF is just here around my corner, leaves Russia, is there any chance for Ukraine to become a new, uh, uh, to become a new uh, uh, land or, uh, uh, for uh, BSF. And this could also be an interesting point to discuss. I think, no, it's too early, but we should have it in our minds. What chances are uh, that Western firms are leaving Russia? Can they come back to Ukraine? Exactly. Yes, this thank you very much. So we have a last, last minute comment from Tomasz. So yes. it will be the last comment or question. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, thank you very much for the very, very nice, very nice uh, presentation. I would like to say that, yeah, that's, it's very important. I think that it's, it will be the time to discuss what will be after the war. But the question is how to alive during the war. Because, uh, because still, you know, the Ukrainian fighting uh, in Ukraine, but the economy situation and the situation of the of the of the small and medium medium sized enterprises are very important now because they should earn money they should have uh, oxygen and oxygen is a business is a, is is activity yeah? and it's very nice uh, proposal just to try to buy kind of services Goods from Ukraine, but as also we, I think that we should we should thinking how to also maybe export some products to Ukraine to give a possibility to re rebuild or, or rebuild the I don't know the flats block of flats uh, the 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 house uh, uh, before before because I have a quite 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 good contacts uh, and a lot of contact in Ukraine I. Before this meeting, I, I I call to my colleagues, to my colleagues, to my friends, to my customers, partners uh, from Ukraine, and the situation is uh, quite uh, complicated because, for example, one of the guy who had a very good, uh, successful company in Kharkiv, he is now in Germany. So zero activity. And he is asking me help me to establish the business in Poland. Okay. The second one, the production on the on the on the Windows uh, North one, the biggest pro producer of uh, second 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 biggest producer of the Windows in in Ukraine, located in the north part of Kiev, in the territory of his territory was a base of Russian army, and the company is destroyed. So he frozen. The business, yeah. Uh, the, it's a, also the problem with the labor, with the because the, with the workers, because the workers, part of the workers are abroad, part of the workers are in the army. Uh, the, you mentioned that uh, five, seven million people are uh, reallocated across across the Ukraine. So I think that, of course, they also. They also they also mentioned uh, me about uh, what should be changed. But after the war, what should be changed? What was the uh, how to say limits for them to create a better turnover limits in the small and, and mid-sized mid enterprises? And uh, I have a list of of, of these uh, claims from the from this uh, businessmen. But uh, I think that we should we should we should find a way how to help them now. What to do now? Yeah, now how to help them to alive. Not only to move the weapon, it's very important, maybe most important. Yeah, but also how to 
create kind of business. And maybe it could be the one of the of the next uh, the, the table created by Olga. How what to do now? Yeah. Well, actually, it should I be the very very real real proposal. Yeah. Well, I actually have a suggestion to all of us here yes. to just produce a two page uh, document, a policy brief of a sort and collect all of the solutions that we have discussed today and just, you know, write it down and put it out there. So maybe it can, you know, help someone or also give some ideas to to people who who make decisions because that's the most important thing, right? So uh, I will contact all of you and let's work on this very short two page pager uh, so that we collect all of these that we have worked on today that we have discussed uh, about today and let's let's just make some uh, help you know in practice so thank you very much everyone. So, so, Wolfgang do you still want to say something because you're you're no okay yeah so. Thank you very much, everyone, for your time today, for excellent uh, talks that you did, for very interesting uh, points for the discussion, uh, food for thought. It was really great to have you all here. Thank you very much for your time today, for everyone who participated, for all of your questions and discussion points. Uh, we will have another uh, roundtable on the 11th of May, and I will make sure to invite all of you. You will uh, be sent the invitation with the link and all of the details. This roundtable will be on the Institute development and of Ukraine and harmonization of institutions uh, um, in light of the EU integration. So I hope to see you all there in roughly two weeks. Thank you very much for today and have a good day. And Slava Thank Ukraine! Slava Ukraine! Slava!